This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Our scriptural text for today comes from the 32nd chapter of the book of Genesis, verse 22 through 24. Notice there these words. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two servant wives, and his 11 sons and crossed the Jabbok River with them. And after taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. Then Jacob, now this left Jacob all alone in the camp and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break i'm talking today simply from the subject the lonesome road the lonesome road i know that a lot of people don't like to be alone and particularly folks that are extroverts gregarious people that just love to be around other people. There are some folks that enjoy people to the degree that they are energized when they are around other people. And then if you're an introvert, being around too many people saps your energy. And so no matter how big of a family that you might grow up in, no matter how much you are the life of the party, there are some elements along this journey that we call life that you must take alone. You can't take a crowd with you. There are some uh, issues and things that you deal with in this life that you cannot take another with. We were really born, though, to be social beings. We were born to live in community. And yet there are certain things that you deal with internally that cannot be sorted out in the presence of other people. And so there are some lonely roads on this journey that we call life. There are some situations that you will encounter that your mama and your daddy can't do for you. That best friend can't go with you. That a sibling cannot go with you. We need an encounter with God. There are so many things along this what I would call the lonely, this lonesome road that you have to do for yourself. Nobody can go to the gym and exercise for you where you get the benefit. Now you can hire somebody to come in and clean your car and clean your house and mow the lawn and trim the hedges, but nobody can go and exercise for you. And then you expect to get the cardio benefit while somebody else is running on a treadmill for you. If they are doing the exercise, they're going to get the benefit. You have to go and do it yourself. There are certain things on this lonesome road that you cannot delegate. And no matter how many folks that you have with you, when you really get into high-intensity training, you don't have the wind to carry on a conversation. That's a long time, and you build uh, in that lonely season. You can get in places in life that you never thought that you would be. You see people when you're younger, you see other folks getting operations, but if you ever get ill and you have to have an operation, you can't send anybody into the operating room for you. Nobody can take the operation and then you, you become better. Nobody can take your chemotherapy for you or the radiation treatments in, your, in the treatment of cancer for you. Nobody else can do that. You have to do that. That's a lonesome road. There are people that can give you their sympathy and their empathy, but they cannot take that journey for you. That's a part of the lonesome road. When you deal with depression, you're locked into that all by yourself. Nobody, you can't bring your friends into your depression. When you suffer with depression, you can even go to a party and still feel like you're all by yourself. That's a part of the lonesome road. Let me tell you, if you live this life long enough, you will bump into some challenges of some things that you never thought that you would deal with. 
that this is for the other guy. This is for somebody else, but you never thought that this would be you until it is you. Nobody else can, can eat for you. Nobody else can lose weight for you. Nobody else can hurt for you. Sometimes a mother will, will have a, a child to get hurt, and they say, baby, I wish I could, I could take the pain for you, but they can't. That's a lonesome road. That's a lonesome road. Nobody can go down that journey for you. But there's something on this lonesome road that brings us into an encounter with ourselves that we have to have an awakening to. And it lets us know that when you cannot change the circumstances, you're then forced to be able to change yourself. We learned that from some of the brilliance of the uh, uh, psychologist who was a uh, Holocaust survivor, Viktor Frankl. He said, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. That's what happens on the lonesome road. You're challenged to change yourself. This is where Jacob was. Jacob was on a lonesome road where he had sent over all of his possessions, his children, his spouses, his servants, everything that he had that was connected to his life, to his success. He had to send it over. And then he had a confrontation with God and self. But there are just some roads that you can't take other folks. You can't take your classmate, your road dog, your ace boon coon, whatever you call them. There are some areas of the road of life that are lonesome. They're narrow. It's, it's almost like going on the, the whole parable of the footprints in the sand. And you know, it's like when it got really difficult, when it was most extreme, you discovered that there was only one set of prints lonesome and you feel like you're all by yourself and then the Lord says no 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 I was carrying you during that time when you thought you were alone it is not by might nor by power but it is by my spirit so God says even when you were going alone and when you looked down and you saw a set of prints they weren't even yours you were not walking in your own strength sometimes you were walking in the power of a prayer that a grandmother prayed for you this is beyond just you you're not walking in your own strength. It's not what it looks like. It, it might look like you are in this thing all alone, but you're not all alone. You've got more help than what you realize. But on the lonesome road, on the lonesome road, there are some realizations that you come to because you have a confrontation with self and with your inadequacies and with your limitations and with your failure and with your humanity. You just have a lot of realizations that happen to you on the lonesome road. And it's interesting that others can accompany you only to a certain point on your journey. They can only go so far with you. When it comes into a sick room, you can only go so far. When it comes to a dying room, you can only go so far. When it comes to depression, you can only go so far. There are certain of these experiences that you experience all alone. Even people that told you that I'll always be here for you. There are certain places that they can't go with you. But we need alone time. Everybody needs alone time. We all need alone time. Number one, to pray. Just to be able to drive us to our knees. It's not about you. You were not designed to be able to live life independent of God. We came from God. And we have to stay connected to him in order to live. So you need alone time just to drive you to be able to pray. It's hard to pray when you're trying to entertain folks. So he'll give you some alone time just to be able to pray. Number, number two, to, to think. You need some alone time just so you can collect your thoughts, so you can think through where you are, what needs to be done, what God wants to do in the next season of your life. You have to pray and then you have to think. A prayer is not a substitute for thinking. You love God with your heart, your soul, your mind. There's a reason that God left your mind there and said to you, love him with your mind. You love God with your mind because you have to think through some things. God's not going to tell you every little thing. He's given you the faculty of your reasoning capacities in your mind so, for a reason. So when you get alone, he wants you to think. Have you ever had to discipline young children and you put them in timeout? You don't just put a child in timeout. 
You explained to them what they did that was unacceptable. And you said, I am putting you in, in time out, and I want you now to think about what you just did. I want you to think about what was unacceptable. This is not just putting a person in a corner and making them look at the wall. This is giving you time to think about what you did so the next time you make a better choice. This is about thinking so you can change your behavior going forward. I can't change what happened in the past, but this is about thinking ahead so that you can figure out what you did that was unacceptable and that we're going to do something differently. And I want you to think about what you did and the consequences. You're facing consequences right now to let you know that there is a consequence to every action and you have every right to choose the action, but you have no right to choose the consequences. I want you to think about what you're doing, where you're going, and where it will cause you to be in your future and so you pray and then you think number three you reflect you reflect reflection brings us back into this place of Thanksgiving because reflection turns experience into insight and people uh, you know if you've ever heard the experience that experience is the best teacher it's not just experience that's the best teacher it is reflected experience that is the best teacher because if you have an experience and you don't reflect on it, you don't really learn the lesson from it to say, how do I now apply this in my life moving forward? It is reflected experience. What just happened? What did I learn? What do I need to keep? What do I need to improve? What do I need to, uh, to do better you, you know, in my life? What do I need to cut loose? You start thinking through it in that reflective process. So you pray, you think, you reflect. Number four, you stop and breathe. Just stop and breathe. We live life so much in drive, 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 drive until we burn out and God just says, you know what, I'm going to take you on a lonely road. I'm going to pull you away from people because you, you need some time out. And I'm going to make what used to work for you not work in this season because I want you to stop and breathe. I want to snap you back into another sense to make you better than what you were before. And, and so he says, I, I, I want you to stop and breathe. Num number five, reset. Maybe, maybe God is putting you in a place here just to be able to reset you, to reset how you think, to reset your emotion, to recalibrate you. This, this, this is a reset. This, this is to, to get you back to the core of what is right and what is proper and what is good. He's trying to reset us. It's a time to pray. It's a time to think. It's a time to reflect. It's a time to stop and breathe. It's a time to reset. It's a time to gain perspective. I mean, whenever you're on a lonesome road, this is a time to gain perspective because this is not about others. This is about me and God. This is a time to gain perspective perspective. I need to just gain perspective. I need to say, what, what just happened in my life? And, and, and sometimes if you don't have proper perspective, you will think that you are where you are because you've made all of the right decisions, all of the right associations. And God wants you, when you get the right perspective, you will see that this was not just about you, but this was the hand of God that was on your life. It wasn't because of your degree and where you went to school and because you had a hookup over here at this company. It was God. It was God. God says, I want you to be able to get a perspective and realize that this is not because you are so smart or because you are so good or because you dotted every I and crossed every T that you are where you are. God says, I want you to get a God perspective that my hand is upon you, that my favor is upon you, that I have opened doors for you and given you opportunities that you could not have paid for even with money. God says, if you will trust me and if you will walk, I will let my favor come upon you and favor will open doors that money could not open for you and influence and God will just let you just meet up with somebody and for some reason they like you and you don't understand why they like you and now are giving you this opportunities. God will put your name on the lips of people that you may not even know. I'm here to tell you and they'll say, have you considered so and so? I think that there's a person here in this department. God can recommend you and you don't even understand how you got accepted in this school, how you got recommended for this scholarship. You won't even know it. it is the hand of God that is upon you. He's just trying to give you perspective to let you know it's not all that meets the eye, that there are some things that are working uh, surreptitiously. Some things that are working underground that you cannot see that I was ordering your steps. I know you thought that it was a travesty 
and that you would never live again. But God says you will live again. And what you produced before failed, but God says if you'll hang with me, I'll let the next thing that you produce be greater than what just died. What you just lost, I'm here to tell you, God will never ever tie your destiny to who left you. My God, who am I talking to in this place today? That when God has for you what God has for you, it is for you. And he's not going to put your destiny in the hands of a two-legged human being that got tired of you, frustrated with you, disgusted with you. They didn't understand that God is able to change. Can the leopard change his spots? He may not be able to change it, but there is a God that is able to dip you in the precious blood of Jesus. And he's able to get it. He can shout it out. He can pray it out. He can deliver it out. He can cast it out. I'm here to tell you that there is a God who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, and above anything that you can ask or think. It's not over. I'm just here to tell you the best is yet to come. Touch somebody, tell them the best is yet to come. So we all need a little alone time just to pray, to think, to reflect, to stop and breathe, to reset, to gain perspective, and then to reimagine. Have you ever taken a little time to just reimagine? To say, God, maybe, maybe you're not finished with me. Maybe I'm not too old. Who told you that? You go and study the book and watch what God would do with old people. The father of our faith was an old man that didn't get started till he was 75. And how old are you? You remember Zacharias and Elizabeth? Old folks. But God had a purpose. When God's hand is on you, God brings something new out of something old. Baby, she capacitor. Just when they think that they are writing you off, that you have just reached the pinnacle, God will shift you into another gear. And let me just tell you this, whenever you're driving with God, you think that you're bad because you're young and you got a lot of energy, you're just in first gear. When you shift into second, second can go faster than first. Third goes faster than second. Fourth goes faster than third. Some of us are into our fourth quarter right now. We getting ready to roll. My God, you, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, you are. Yes, you better take care of your car. You better take care of yourself. You get ready to roll now. You get, and, and when you shift in the fourth gear, it's not as much effort. You start cruising. You start rolling. Shift, shift. Look up toward heaven and say, shift me, Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but God always saves the best wine until last. Yes, yes, he does. May I remind you of this truth that it is better to be alone than to be with somebody who makes you feel alone. It's better to be alone than to be with somebody, stuck with somebody who makes you feel alone. But I love something that Janet Fitch said. She said, loneliness allows your soul room to grow. Loneliness allows your soul room to grow. And sometimes you didn't realize what God was doing in your life because he put you on a lonesome road. But that solitude, allows room for your soul to grow and sometimes when your life is not making sense when things are not adding up in your life it's time to start subtracting when you start subtracting you start simplifying when you start subtracting you you you, you get clear it, it, it's impossible almost to organize without eliminating organization involves elimination you, you, when you organize your, your closet and you got four different sizes, <laughs> I know you're going to get back into it one day. 
I know. I know you are. But when you really get organized, instead of having four different sizes, when you're on the lonesome road, it begins to bring your attention back to what's really important so that you can move forward. It's not about setting you back, it's about setting you up. He's just setting us in a place on a lonesome road to give us time to think and to reflect and reset and to reimagine what God can do. Jacob had gotten blessed with his uncle Laban for many years, but he had defrauded his brother Esau, his twin brother. And now God was trying to get him in a place to say, you, you, you thought that I'd just max you out with Uncle Laban. But I'm just getting started. And I'm going to send you back to the very thing that you were running away from. Because don't assume that what you left is the same thing that you're coming back to. Because God says, I've changed some things. It's not visible to the naked eye, but I have changed some things. I love something that Arthur Schopenhauer said. He said, a man can be himself only as, uh, uh, so long as he is alone. And if he does not love solitude, he will not love freedom. For it is only when he is alone that he's really free. You can learn to get comfortable in your own skin while you're by yourself. This is not specific to men. This is men and women. You got to learn how to be comfortable in your own skin. You got to learn how to enjoy your own company. I mean, who in the world do you talk to when nobody else can be there? You are, you, you, I mean, you got to have, you got to be your own advocate. And, and, and love yourself. You can't love others if you don't love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So there has to be a freedom and just even in, in the solitude of who you are. And one of the reasons that I believe that we have this whole experience of the lonesome road is so that we come to an understanding of, of the wrestling of this dual nature that we have on the inside. One is human, the other one is a hero. We got a human and a hero. Both of them exist within us. We all know the human. We're acquainted with the human, with our frailties, with our sensitivities, with our inadequacies, with our flaws. We know our human too well. But solitude helps us to uncover the hero that is within us. Uh, Jacob knew his human, but he didn't know his hero. He didn't realize that God was going to use him as a hero to his whole family and then to the nation. He could not imagine. He was so focused on what was flawed that he couldn't see what God had really already fashioned by his own glory and destiny. He couldn't see it. So the human side of all of us is evident, but the hero side of us must be cultivated and discovered. That there are two sides, the human and the hero. The human and the hero. The human is evident. You know your flaws. You know your weaknesses. You know your, your natural tendencies, every proclivity that you have. But the hero side of us must be cultivated and developed. It has to be developed. Uh, that there's a hero inside of every person. Hero, uh, I use it as an acronym for this. The H is humility. Humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Humility. You have to walk in humility. God exalts the humble. Heroes are really humble. I mean, when you have a, a hero that saves somebody's life, they, they don't think that anything special was about it. When you're a real hero, that humility says, you know what, I was just doing what anybody should do. That is, that's the humility of a hero. They don't like, yeah, yeah you know, I, yeah, I mean, I got it like that. Yeah, 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 I'm the man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know God used me, you know, yeah, yeah, everything was, yeah, it was about me, yeah. No, no, a real, a real hero says, I was just available for God. I was just doing what God put me in the earth to do. I was supposed to do this, and I would have wanted anybody to do this for me, and I was just doing it for them. It's an attitude of humility. The, the E is endurance. They don't let themselves get worn out and quit in the face of challenge or tiredness or controversy. They have endurance. They have humility. They have endurance. The aura is righteousness, which is simply doing what is right because it is right. It's not doing what's right because somebody's looking at you. It's doing what is right because it is right. 
Righteousness is God's way of doing things. It's called righteousness. It's a God thing that we do because God is in it. And the O is others focused. Others focused is dying to your own will so that you can serve other people. Now here's my challenge to you. Here's my challenge to you. Refuse to die until you have unearthed the hero within. Because you were born to make a difference. Be someone's hero. Be someone's hero. Be someone's hero. You ought to endeavor to live your life in such a way where somebody has to thank you and say, you know, that because of you, I didn't give up. Because of you, I didn't quit my marriage. Because of you, I didn't walk out on my children. Because of you, I didn't throw my faith away. Because of you, I, I, I wasn't afraid to launch out into my own business. Be somebody's hero. Refuse to die until you have unearthed the hero that is within you because you were born to make a difference. Lay your hand on your chest right now and say, I was born to make a difference. Say it again, I was born to make a difference. Say it again, I was born to make a difference. And you were, you were, you were. Even if it's nothing but if you've gone through trauma or abuse and it should have killed you and messed you up for the rest of your life, but somehow you survived. Whenever you've been through abuse, you can look in the eyes of another person that's been abused and recognize that. And when you then become proof positive that if I was abused and if I went through that and if I'm still here, if I was able to survive, when they look at you, then you ought to be able to say, if I can live, you can live too. And that because of you, become somebody's hero. People will try to punish you. They'll put you down. They'll judge you with negative words out of their mouth. They'll ostracize you. They'll criticize you. They'll try to throw you away and say that you're finished. But when God has not finished, when he, he put an ellipsis and all they saw was a period. But he's, when you see an ellipsis, it means stay tuned. That something else is getting ready to follow this. That I'm getting ready to connect what just happened with something that's about to happen. So he says, don't, don't you dare stop and get stuck and put a period where I'm adding an ellipsis, a series of periods. When he says a period, that is a shifting time. That God says, I'm getting ready to do some stuff. I'm getting rid of some stuff, and I'm bringing in some other stuff. Because what I'm going to make on the other side of that ellipsis of what other people saw as a period, if you just keep looking, just keep looking. If you just keep looking. If you just keep looking. If you will just keep looking. Sometimes your life will feel as though you have gotten down to a big fat goose egg that is nothing but a big fat zero. And when you have perspective of God, you'll realize that's not a zero. That's a portal to be able to see brand new opportunities that I couldn't see before I can see an opportunity now that I didn't see before I see you I see you you ought to be waiting and watching and looking for opportunities for God to be able to shift you to a brand another a brand new level God's trying to get us ready for some things don't you die until you have unearthed the hero within you there's a hero in you every boy that you meet every girl that you meet there's a hero in them don't you dare raise them to just think that you're not just another little mouth to feed. You're not another mouth to feed. You're another mouth to be able to speak truth. You are another person to be able to make a difference in the world. There's a hero on the inside of you. Not only for your family, but for your classmates. And for your job where you are and in your neighborhood, there's a hero in you. There's a hero in you. Can you imagine what a different world our world would be if we trained every young people to see that they are not a problem, but you're a hero? You're a person that rescues people. You're the one that when you see bullying goes on, they say, eh, 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 you, uh, uh, bro, bro, back up. Bro, back up. They, they need to see a real hero. Excuse, eh, eh, excuse me. That's not how we treat women. Excuse me. That they need to be able to see a hero that will say, my babies are going to eat even if I don't eat. That's a hero that will say, I'm going to roll up my sleeve and I'm going to work my fingers to the bone. I'm going to do whatever is necessary. That's a hero. That's a hero. You have to unearth the hero in you. There's not just a human in you. Stop making excuses for your humanity. Yeah, God knows I'm just human. But the, yeah, you are just human. But you also, there's a hero in you. Don't you dare put a period where God is putting an ellipsis. There is a hero in you. Don't just settle for the human. All heroes 
individuals are human. God uses our humanity, our flawed natures, our weaknesses to say that I want to be one just like you. God didn't get an Egyptian to deliver the children of Israel. He got an Israelite. Moses was not an Egyptian. He was an Israelite. God says, I want to use somebody that looks like you. Somebody from your background. I'm going to let them make it out of the hood. Not to just say they made it out, but they created a path for some other folks to get out. That's a hero. That's a hero. I don't want to be the only one in my company. Let me be the first one. A hero makes a room for others. A hero paves a way for others to be able to get out. I don't want to just get out. I want to show somebody else the way to say, hey, hey, hey. I, I, I love it. You know, you know if, if you're in coach, you may as well put me on the exit road. I will direct others to the exit after I leave and say, follow me. <laughs> a leader knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. Follow me. Follow me. That's a hero. They make a way for others. They show them the way. Show people a way out. Show people a way out. And you have to learn to be okay when it comes to wrestling. You will wrestle with thoughts. Jacob was wrestling with thoughts and imaginations. He was wrestling with ideas and philosophies. He was wrestling with behaviors. He was wrestling with problems. He was wrestling with patterns. He was wrestling. There are times whenever I read my Bible and there are some things that, that I don't always understand and I wrestle with the text. I cannot tell you how much wrestling I have done with this book. Of some things that didn't make sense to me and I said, God, open it up. Lord, show me, show me. Holy Spirit, great teacher, unveil it to me. I've wrestled with it. And it didn't always come within the hour. Sometimes I've wrestled for days and weeks. There's some things that I've wrestled with and it took years before understanding came. And when it came, I recognized, God, this came out of a wrestle. I have wrestled with this. Anybody know what I'm talking about? There's some things that you will wrestle with and you don't understand why, but keep wrestling. Keep wrestling. You have to be like a Jacob that says, I'm not going to turn you loose until you bless me. Until you bless me. Until you bless me with the revelation. Until you bless me with the understanding. Until you bless me with the deliverance. Until you bless me with the healing. Hold on until you get your blessing. Hold it on until you get your, your blessing. You know, whenever you're alone, particularly when it's dark at nighttime, your imagination runs wild with you. It has a way of exaggerating things and making them seem bigger than what they really are. Because the devil knows that if he makes an issue that you need to confront seem too big, you'll keep putting it off. I mean, it could be as simple as going in and cleaning your kitchen. And if there are too many dishes pile up in it, every time you think about it, it just drains your energy. Because you just start thinking about plates and cups and stuff that is hard and pots and pans. And like, I don't even want to, oh, Jesus. Uh -uh. I don't fool with that right now. I don't want to fool with it. I don't want to fool with it. Because he's made it a monster in your mind. He's made it bigger than what it actually is. Well, back in the day, our grandmamas got in a, in a sink with, with, with suds. And they didn't even have automatic dishwashers. We call ourselves washing dishes. We, we, we're not really washing it. We just put it in a machine to wash it. They had to do it the old-fashioned way. They had to wash and rinse and had a little rack there for it to dry. And they had towels and stuff all over the counter. And they, they had to process it the old-fashioned way. But they had a way of, of multitasking. That while they were just attacking it because they knew that it had to be done. And the longer that you delay it, you're going to be creating a bigger mess. And more dishes are going to be added to it. And so they would start humming. And they washed their dishes. And they used hot water. And, 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 and they rinsed them. And, and they were much cleaner than a machine could get it. And their glasses sparkled. And their silverware was clean. 
And they did it because they were multitasking, using it as a time to commune with God. They, were, they, they pulled up the old hymns of the church, and sometimes they were just praying, Lord Jesus. They're praying for their children. They're praying for their spouse. They're just praying while they were washing. They, they, were, multi, they, they were not looking at soap operas. They weren't online checking out the social media. Uh, they, they, were, they, were, they were in connection with God who was giving them perspective. They were doing something that was recalibrating their soul. Uh, you don't even realize that sometimes as you clean, it can actually be cathartic to getting clutter out of your other minds and some solutions that you couldn't see that while you're sweeping and running the vacuum, somehow as you're cleaning up this, something gets cleaned up here. And now you can see clearly what you need to do. There's something about being in motion. There's something about being in motion and you're all by yourself. You're not talking to anybody. You're talking to him. And somehow when you talk to him, he starts working things out. So he was Jacob preparing to meet the brother that he had defrauded the birthright out of years ago. And his messengers came back to him and told him, they said, listen, your brother, we, we went with the messages that you were trying to take us, but he's got an army of 400 men with him. And Jacob started freaking out. But when he started, when he began to panic, he started to pray. When Jacob began to panic, he started to pray. That's a principle. Whenever you start, begin to panic, start to pray in. It's hard to panic and pray at the same time. If you see a loved one go into a medical emergency, though your flesh is panicking, your spirit ought to be praying. And you need to start immediately, just go in the name of Jesus. The moment that you start panicking, start praying. The moment that you begin to panic, start to pray in. And that's exactly what Jacob did. You'll see it in Jacob chapter 32, verse 9 through 12. Notice, he knowing that his brother was coming to kill him, Jacob prayed. He said, oh God of my grandfather Abraham and God of my father Isaac, oh Lord, you told me return to your own land and to your relatives and you promised me that I will treat you kindly. And I'm not worthy of all the unfailing love and the faithfulness that you've shown to me, your servant. When I left home and crossed the Jordan River, I owned nothing except a walking stick. And now my household fills two large camps. Oh, Lord, please rescue me from the hand of my brother Esau. I'm afraid that he's coming to attack me along with my wives and children. But you promise me I will surely treat you kindly. And I will multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as the sands along the seashore. Too many to count. Jacob had to remind himself and he reminded God what God had prophetically said to him concerning his life. Here's the principle that I want you to get. That the story that you tell yourself shapes your future. The story that you tell yourself shapes your future. The story that you tell yourself. Whatever story you are narrating to yourself is shaping your future. Now let me say this to you. Feelings are very real. I know that feelings are real and I'm not trying to diminish their reality. Feelings are real. But the message oftentimes that feelings deliver is not right. Feelings are real and they deliver a message but their message is not always right because the feelings, you can feel rejected, but you may be loved. You can feel unloved and you actually have love. So feelings are real, but their message is not always right. That's why you can't trust your feelings. That the whole world is against you. No, no, no. You need to see the hand of God, things that have been working in your favor that you're not taking under consideration right now because you're being guided by the feelings and not by the facts. Feelings are real, but their message is not always right. Sometimes a person, you might feel that somebody doesn't like you, and they don't even know you. And your feeling, you will respond to them according to how you feel. Because most people, when they even ask you, how are you today, they ask you, how are you feeling? And most people follow their feelings. If they feel rotten, that's the way they act and respond to people. 
If they feel happy, that's the way they respond. Feelings are real, but their message is not always right. And that's why you have to press through to come to the truth. Because your feelings will be whispering a message into your ears. And whatever message is whispered into your ears echoes in your mind. And it will keep speaking to you. But never let anxiety fool you into thinking that this is how you will be for the rest of your life. And that's what anxiety does. Anxiety keeps on saying, this is how the rest of your life is going to be. This is how the rest of your life, and it puts you in a panic, and it puts you in the fear. But whenever you start to panic, begin to pray. Whenever you start to panic, begin to pray. Whenever you start to panic, begin to pray. Whenever you start panicking, begin to pray. It's amazing. The devil is absolutely notorious in magnifying the little, taking something that's a molehill and making it look like a mountain. And this is where you have to ask yourself the question when the devil brings that feeling to you. Ask yourself the question, is anything too hard for the Lord? It's just, a, it's just a recalibrating question that puts things back in perspective. Is anything too hard for the Lord? But you don't know my husband. Is anything too hard for the Lord? But you don't know my wife. Is anything too hard for the Lord? You don't understand my boss on my job. Is anything too hard for the Lord. You don't know my children. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I was reading this past week about a woman's father who took his own life and she began to write. She said he was an engineer and he had a good career. She said, but he never spoke openly about how he felt. She said, but he was physically healthy, running daily. She said, but he was a son, a husband, a father. She said, but he had countless friends and was loved by many. She said, he was financially stable. She said, he also had a degree in psychology. She said, but he was 45 and saving for an early retirement at 50. Because suicide doesn't always have signs. And that's why you have to check on people even when it looks like they have it all. On paper like it's all together but whether you know it or not every day in America 22 veterans commit suicide 22 commit suicide every day you never do know and there's so many people that are hanging on by the thinnest of threads and so I encourage you treat people with kindness you know why because you could be that thread your word of encouragement could be that thread. There are people that are hanging on by thread and all that they need is kindness and encouragement. When, when you put people in encouragement, it really begins to say that that's, God has faith in your future. That this is not where it ends and this is not how it ends. But I want you to be re reminded of the words of Voltaire when he said that every man is guilty of all the good that he did not do. Every woman is guilty of the good that he or she did not do. Though there are some lonesome roads, God said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I will never ever leave you nor forsake you. And the very first time in all of God's creation that God said that something was not good, it was when he looked and noticed that the man was alone. Everything else he had created, the firmament, he said, is good. The birds of the air, is good. Every creeping thing upon the earth, he said, is good. The sun, moon, and the stars, good. The first time that God ever spoke and said that something was not good is when he saw that the man was alone. And it is not to say that every man needs to be married. They don't. Every woman doesn't need to be married. But he said it's not good that they be alone. I will create for them a helper. You know why? Because men need help. We need all the help we can get. 
And God wants us to be able to look to him as that helper in our own lives. That whenever you're on that lonesome road and you're feeling that nobody else knows what I'm dealing with, there are too many people that suffer in silence and their pride and their perceived sense of strength that they want everybody to always look to them to be the strong one. Do you realize that whoever is the strong one that everybody is turning to has their weaknesses? And here, Jacob has two camps full of stuff. He has sent his wives ahead of him. He sent all of his children ahead of him. He sent his servant ahead of him. He sent all of his possession, all of his livestock, everything that represented his wealth and his success, he sent it ahead to the degree that he was left alone. And God is bringing us to a point in our life where he's saying that this is not about who you're married to. This is not about the children that you produce out of your life. It's not about the possessions that you accumulate. This is not about your titles, your accolades. If you strip away all of your possessions, all of your servants, all of your employees, all of your associates, your co-workers, your neighbors, if you strip away your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, if you strip away all of that, who are you? When you are then left alone, Jacob was left alone. And there, when he was left alone, he wrestled. When you've got too much stuff, you don't even realize that you are alone. And God separated him from his stuff so that he would have to deal with the man in the mirror. That's who God wants to deal with. The man in the mirror the woman in the mirror. This is not about the stuff. It's about the person. He's calling you on your lonesome journey with things that only you and God understand. There's something that you've not even told your best friend. There are some deep thoughts and feelings that you've had on the in inside that you don't even dare vocalize to anybody. But you can always talk to Jesus. He will never leave you. And you wrestle with him. Give him your ideas, your plans. Wrestle with him. Wrestle. And please understand that the name Jacob, he had lived with this name all of his life. It means supplanter. It means con artist. It means trickster. It means deceiver. Can you imagine every time somebody called his name, they're calling you trickster, deceiver, how could that make you feel and now he's living out of the reality of that? He's been tricking people all of his life, lying all of his life. Now he's sick and tired of who he has discovered himself to be. He had all of this stuff and God separated him from, from the stuff so he could see himself. And because he was a hero, he had a hero buried inside of that human failure, the human facade. And now God brings him to himself. And he lays hold of the angel of the Lord and he says, I'm not going to turn you loose, endurance, until you bless me. I'm not going to turn you loose. And the blessing was not something that he put out and started counting out in cash or in that that represented money at all. The angel of the Lord simply asked him, he says, what's your name? He only asked him a question to point him to the source of all of his trouble. He says, your name, because you see, the name is a revelation of your nature. He'd been living out the nature of a deceiver all of his life. And this is what had him in trouble with his brother Esau, was the deceptive nature. He tricked him. And his mother was his own accomplice. And now here is God. And here is Jacob. And Jacob is saying, I've been a trickster all of my life. A deceiver all of my life. It's like, God, I, I've been so playing a role, I don't even, I've forgotten who I am. He said, I'm not going to turn you loose until you bless me. 
That's when he asked him, what's your name? He was letting them know that all of the problems, the existence of everything that you're living out in behavior is based on, the, on your self-image of a deceiver. He says, your name, it was the blessing. The blessing was a name change. From Jacob to Israel, prince with God. You will no longer be a deceiver. You will be a prince with God. And once his identity, he says, not only will you not call yourself this, you won't answer to this when other people call you. I'm giving you a new identity. You are a prince with God, a hero. You're a king's kid. You're a king's kid, prince with God. You're a king's kid. You'll walk differently. You'll talk differently. And he was trying to bring us into a brand new place of a brand new identity. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.